Welcome back to another Blender tutorial, and today we're going to talk about facial motion capture. Specifically, I want to talk about how Blender, a free open source program, can be turned into a completely free motion capture solution. The workflow we need to go through to get our final result is only six steps long, and it's important to really understand the purpose of each step so you can extrapolate these techniques beyond the niche case of facial tracking. Obviously, the first thing we need to do is record some footage we want to motion capture. This means we need some way to quickly add high quality tracking markers all around the face using a black sharpie marker. Chances are you have one lying around somewhere and it really does work with most skin tones. Of course, the big disadvantage to both sharpies and whiteout is that they're very hard to remove from your skin. You also have the fact that they're both considered somewhat toxic. So instead, what I recommend is finding some kind of dark makeup and using that to create the markers. Not only is it meant to be put on skin, but it washes away much more easily. So for those of you who don't have any makeup lying around, try to find someone who does, or of course you can just use the Sharpie solution. And when we're ready to actually apply these tracking markers, there are a few simple principles we want to follow. First of all, we want to identify the areas of the face that will deform the most during capture. In general, these are areas like the mouth, eyes, and eyebrows, and in these areas we want to apply more tracking markers than usual. The higher the density of our markers, the more detail we'll end up getting in our capture. That being said, we still want to avoid adding markers and areas that the camera can't see. These are areas like under the nose, the side of the face, and areas obstructed by your hair. Otherwise, we can add markers pretty much anywhere else in a symmetric fashion so we don't get any extra detail on one side of the face. And now that we've drawn in our markers, we want to make sure we're filming our footage correctly. And the safest way to do this is with a head-on shot with minimal camera shake. This way, our markers stay visible throughout the whole shot so we can get the full deformation, and we also avoid having any camera movement interpreted as part of the performance. So the types of shots that are bad for motion capture are shots where some of our trackers are obstructed and also shots where we add motion via camera shake. And if we follow these principles, we'll end up with perfectly trackable shots like these. Notice that the lighting conditions don't really matter as long as we can see the markers, and moving shots are also fine as long as the face remains centered. So this is the shot we're going to be using for our motion capture, and before we do any of that tracking, we want to convert our footage into an image sequence which Blender tends to handle much better. So head over to the video editing workspace, which is where we can do this conversion, and import in the footage as a movie strip. The nice thing about this is that Blender will automatically change our project frame rate, however we still need to match our project endpoint. To do this, just find where the movie strip ends and copy over the current frame value into the endpoint slider. Now the last thing we still need to correct is the color of our footage footage which has clearly changed from our original. The setting we can tweak to fix this is called the View Transform and it's located in the Render tab under Color Management. And we just want to switch this from Filmic Mode back over to Standard and we can choose a nicer frame rate to use like 30 frames per second. Finally, to export this out as an image sequence, we can just go to the Output tab and set this to render as a PNG sequence with zero compression and just set an output path for our render. Now to render out our animation, just hit Ctrl F12 and wait for Blender to process through the whole clip. And again, what we're doing here is converting a video file into an image sequence which is frame rate independent. So when our render is done, so now we're ready to transition over to tracking, which means we can get rid of our movie clip and head back over to the layout workspace. Here we should change our 3D viewport into a movie clip editor, which is where we do our tracking, and then import in the image sequence we created. The first thing we want to do is hit prefetch, which will load the whole sequence into memory and prevent Blender from lagging in the future. And for now, let's keep all the default tracker settings and identify a specific marker that we want to track. I'm going to go with this marker on the forehead where we'll drop in a tracker by control clicking. And once we've positioned the pattern area around our feature, we can track this forwards by hitting control T. And in this case, everything worked out perfectly, so we can lock our tracker by either hitting this button or using the shortcut Control L. But in general, the default tracker settings aren't that optimal for these facial markers. For example, if we try to track this marker near the side of the head, our track fails on frame 25. The reason this happens is that the markers are actually deforming throughout the shot, and we're just using the location motion model. This means that the pattern we want Blender to track is actually changing from our initial state. Some other things that can cause issues are subtle lighting changes, and heavy motion blur. So to combat all of this, there are some tracker settings we want to change a bit to help us out. First of all, we need to change the motion model to something that handles distortion. And the two models that can do this are perspective and affine. And since our deformations aren't true perspective changes, but rather just shears and stretches, we'll go for the affine model. Some other things we can change is enabling normalize to make the tracking invariant to lighting changes and also bringing up our correlation to 0.9, which means we need 90% confidence on each frame or else 
the tracking will terminate. And now that we've made these changes, let's add the tracker back in and have it track forwards. So clearly these tracking parameters are much better than what we had before, and we can use this to get through the rest of the markers. This time let's try tracking a group of them which we can select with A, scale up to cover our features, and track forwards with Control T. So even when we're tracking multiple features at once, we're still getting really fast and accurate results that we can supervise in case there are any errors. So let's lock in this group with Control L and repeat this with the next cluster. We're going to come back to the markers right above the eye since they're a bit tricky, but for now we'll just keep progressing down the face. This time it successfully completed the track, and in general these are the kinds of techniques we want to use to correct problematic trackers. So let's just keep going down to face with the affine model until we only have the markers above the eyes left over. We can hide all the other trackers by hitting H, and just like we've been doing, let's try tracking this last cluster. But when we're done manually supervising these markers, we can unhide everything with Alt H and lock in these trackers. And you can see that in this case, I accidentally skipped over a marker, so we want to go back and track this since this will be valuable data for our motion capture. So now we've successfully tracked all our features and we want to bring this data into our 3D viewport. The way Blender can do this ends up being relative to our camera, so we want to simplify everything by positioning our camera on the Z axis pointing downwards. Now that everything's ready and organized, we need to select all our trackers in the movie clip editor and then under reconstruction hit link empty to track. This brings in all our trackers as empties which are entirely relative to our camera so they always stay in front of it and we just want to scale these down to make everything in our viewport less cluttered. And if we go into the camera view and play through this animation you can see that these empties almost seem to outline the structure and motion of the face. We'll be using this data to drive our motion capture but of course we need to add some depth information. Currently we only have two dimensional data which corresponds to the x and y motion of our trackers, but of course the face doesn't exist on a single plane. Our approach to solving this issue will first require us to have a mesh of the face, which we'll use to add in the depth information. Of course, modeling a face is actually pretty difficult, so we need to go over some methods to generate this mesh automatically. There's a program called FaceGen Modeler, which is very expensive, but it turns out that the free demo version actually has all the tools we need. And I should mention that with this demo version, we don't have the legal right to distribute the exported model, but since we're just doing motion capture, there really isn't any reason to distribute the mesh in the first place. And what this program can do is generate a 3D model of your face from only a front-facing photo and two side-facing photos. So this will actually be the method we'll use for this tutorial, since we want our target mesh to match as closely as possible to the footage. When we open up FaceGen, it'll look something like this, and we want to make sure we're in the photo section under the Create tab. This is where we load in our three reference images, and we're just going to import the front photo, the right photo, and the left photo, and now we can hit Next to begin our alignment. Before matching any of the features, make sure that the image is rotated upright, and then all we have to do is locate the features that FaceGen asks for. When we finish going through all the images, we're going to get this prompt, and we just want to leave these checkboxes disabled and hit Create. Usually this processing takes FaceGen under a minute, and we end up getting this custom head model that pretty accurately matches the reference. Now something you might be noticing is the big FaceGen logo across the forehead, which is a watermark that's always placed in the demo version. This really makes the generated texture unusable, but for our purposes we don't even need this texture to begin with. So we can just head over to the file tab, which is where we're going to export our mesh. And the only settings we really want to look out for is the expression, which should be set to current expression, and the mesh format where we can just use a basic obj file. Once our export settings are all ready, we can save this model into a custom directory. And what FaceGen ends up exporting are four files which are the obj we want, the corresponding material file, and two textures for the head and the mouth. Again, we're only going to use the obj file for our motion capture, so we can just delete the other three files. So again, we left off with all our trackers on a single plane, and we want a way to give these depth. To import in the mesh, we can run an import obj, and then select the face model in the directory we chose before. This will bring in a mesh of the head, and also some extra geometry for the inside of the mouth. For our motion capture, we're not going to use this mouth object, so we can delete it, and then also we want to scale down this head so it's in proportion to our trackers. 
and clearly we have a lot of extra geometry here that we don't need for our facial capture. These are areas like the neck and also the entire back of the head. Now the fastest way to isolate our face will actually make use of the UV islands generated by face gem. So just head over to the UV editing workspace and with sync mode enabled select the face island with L. In the 3D viewport we can then invert the selection and delete it. And already we've pretty cleanly isolated the face. And to get rid of some of the remaining excess we can delete some faces on the forehead and also shave down on both sides. Before we use this face to give our empties depth, we need to make sure that it's actually aligned with our footage. We'll do this aligning in the camera view and we can load our sequence as a background by going into the camera tab, enabling background images, and choosing the image sequence which is considered a movie clip. We want to make sure we're doing this aligning on the first frame of our sequence and then we can rotate the face so it's in the correct orientation. And to make this whole process easier, I recommend switching over to wireframe mode by hitting Z and then align this the best that you can. So head over to the scripting workspace and we want to get rid of this line which altered our follow track constraint. What we want to replace this with is a bit of code that we'll add in our armatures. And to get that line of code we can just quickly add in an armature and then delete it so that we get our command in the console window. So just copy that over into our script. Active object and an armature will be added at its world space coordinates. And when we run the script you can see that the armatures got added exactly how we'd expect. And currently it's important to note that these are still separate bone systems however we want to rig this mesh using a single armature. We can combine these together by selecting all of them with a specified active object and then we'll run a join operation. So now all these bones belong to a single armature and we can scale these down in edit mode by using individual origins. To get even more control over this, we can actually edit these regions manually. So with our face selected, head over into weight paint mode and you can already see this sort of heat map. The way you want to interpret this is that the bone on the bridge of the nose can only influence the area that isn't dark blue. More specifically, we say that dark blue has a weight of 0 and as we progress towards red, our weight gets closer and closer to 1. And now we'll just gently paint over any areas where we want our bone to have 0 influence. And indeed, when we move this bone in pose mode, you can see that the deformation isn't reaching the actual eye. So in general, to get the best results with this motion capture, we really want to tweak each weight map individually until we're getting a more physically accurate rig. That being said, the parenting with automatic weights usually gives fairly good results right out of the box, so all this extra stuff is for someone who really wants to optimize this setup. Okay, so we now have our rig completely set up and we also have the tracking data stored in our empties. Obviously, the last step in this process is linking our rig to these empties so that our tracking data turns into actual animation. And the way we're going to do this is by going into pose mode and with a bone selected, head over to the bone constraints tab and add a copy location constraint. This is going to let us pair the bone to its matching empty, but of course we first need to know which empty that is. So back in object mode, just select the empty and in this case we have track 29. Back in the bone constraint, we can add this tracker as the target target and we also want to disable the Z location. And the reason for doing this is that the information we tracked only holds X and Y location data, and the depth we gave these empties was just for initially aligning our bones on first frame, so there's no true Z location data we can pull from. And now with our added constraint, you can see that we're actually getting some animated deformation. To get more of our mesh moving, we just need to keep repeating this process for each bone in the armature with the corresponding empty. And technically we can write a script for this like in all the previous steps, however the big issue here is that the bone name and the empty name aren't always matching. This means we need a way to find which empty should be our constraint target for each of our bones, and this is a bit harder than some of the other scripts we've written so far. But in a moment, we'll go over how to use the provided script that can handle this issue and also automate some of the previous steps. But when we're done adding in the constraints, we get this fully animated face which is using the entire rig. And once this is done processing, you can see we're getting much more responsive playback. So once you've downloaded the free script, you'll get this small text file which we'll be importing into Blender shortly. First of all, we need to make sure that we've already gone through all our tracking and that our face mesh is aligned to the first frame of the sequence, so cap text file. And at this point, we need to make sure that only the face mesh is selected and then we can hit run script. This will most likely freeze Blender for a bit, but the whole script should run in under a minute. When it's done processing, we get all our bones inside one armature, which we can scale down in edit mode to increase visibility. So this script essentially lets us skip the last steps in this work flow and hopefully that saves you a good amount of time. But that's all I have for you guys today so I hope you learned something in this video.